Welcome to the Saudi Family Wines. Welcome to our 2020 annual release of all of our new wines. I'm standing here in the winery with all the stock that's been labeled up. Normally the wines would have been out to distributors and to some of our long-standing collectors. Unfortunately, all the stocks here, we've basically filled up the whole winery. We're actually running out of space as we're labeling on. But hopefully we'll be shipping these wines out as soon as the alcohol ban is lifted. We have decided with a, with, with a turn of events as it is, not having the, the privilege to have you all out to the farm as, as it's been the trend over the last number of years to share all of our wines with you. We've decided to make the small clip this year where we'll be walking through a little bit of the work we've been doing in the vineyard. And at the end of this video, we'll be sharing a little bit of what the new wines are about and what you can expect. Thank you very much for joining and we'll take you through the journey of our vineyards and the basic winemaking at the Saudi Family Wines. Thank you very much. My name is Ibn Saadi. I'm uh, involved with the Saudi Family Wines. We based up about an hour north of Cape Town. We've got a small winery. We produce around 65,000 bottles of wine, which is not a, a lot of wine, but I'm very privileged to work with an incredible team of people. We work with a lot of South Africa's most historic vineyards. And um, the whole concept of our domain is to produce wines that are truly reflectant of the places they come from. And I think in a world obsessed with perfection, I, we kind of mourn a, in a state of mind where we would rather bottle something that's just dead right, honest and true to what it is than this elusive idea of producing the world's most perfect wine. I think we were blessed with making wine out here in the Swartland. It's the biggest region in South Africa in circumference and obviously within all of that we have so very many different vineyards all the way from the coast into the mountains of Paderberg, Ribia Castile, the Paketberg Mountain and yeah we're blessed with an incredibly good climate it's been very dry of late the last three years we've gone through quite a bit of a drought but it's a very good place to grow grapes and it's a very sound place to live and um, yes um, our wines are not available everywhere but if you do take a little bit of time and you do a little bit of research you will find our wines. Um, when I came out here in 1997, obviously it was a completely different landscape. Uh, There's not very many people at least making wines out here, so it represented a great opportunity in a canvas. You know, the, the, if you look at the area, the vastness of the area, vineyards stretching from the coastal plains all the way up into the mountains, be it Paketberg, Castilberg Mountain, Paderberg Mountain, um, the alluvial soils of Darling. So, it was just an amazing place. No people, uh, a lot of old vineyards, and mostly unirrigated. So it's kind of all the ingredients required, and there was just massive opportunity because when I came out here, there wasn't too much going on. It was not like nothing going on, but there was big, three big cooperatives operating, but maybe not with all the intent and all the attention to detail. So I could come in and really start working with niche little vineyards and, and find the better vineyards in Swatland. Then it's now 20 plus years on and it's been just fun. I spend quite a bit of kilometers a year on the road. It's, um, you know, it's the reality of how we operate. I suffer from a little bit of FOMO, so I'm always afraid I'm missing a vineyard somewhere out there in the country, something that could be of a higher quality or something that could be more unique. So we've got vineyards all over. We've got, we farm over a distance of about 400 kilometers and currently it's 45 vineyards. So it's a lot of driving, but at least now the load is kind of shared. It's not just me alone anymore. Um, Paul Jordan, the winemaker drives some of the stretches. Mornay Stein, the viticulturist, he drives a couple of the stages and then myself, so yeah, it's, it's been marginalized, um, but previously I drove a lot. I mean, in the beginning it was just me on my own. So um, <clears throat> I spend less time in the car, but I love it, I enjoy it, it's time to think. I 
I love agriculture. I think it's, it's still a privileged state with all of the complexities and it's very perplexed, but I, you know, the, the fact that you can farm and, and be part of living things and it's amazing. You know, and, and inevitably it all, in all aspects of farming, you've got um, this culture. You know, you think the, the, the cattle here, they just here and they just find there's a science between the, of the, the grazing, the genetics, the health, the veterinary, everything, you know, it's all aspects of farming is just so, so, yeah, it's, you, you, you either need to get completely involved or just give it a miss. We just arrived here at the Footpath Vineyard. Um, it's obviously for me a great privilege to share this vineyard with, with all of you. It's a vineyard that we haven't really photographed or videoed before. This vineyard is very, very unique. It's the oldest vineyard in South Africa that's planted to a field blend. So these are the old Simeon vines that was planted in the early 1800s. This is from 1887. And at that stage, these vines were, you know, it was just generally being referred to as green grape. So it's basically this little stretch here. Then you've got palomino vines starting to come in there. Over there is a little bit more palomino shin here at the back and a little bit of uh, muscat. So completely mixed in amongst the vines. But I mean, these gnarly old vines are just crazy. And everywhere where vines died or passed on, um, we've planted a little vine in. We've interplanted most of our vineyards just to get them complete. It's like, for me, an old age vineyard is it's like um, an old age home. You must always bring in new, younger life, you know? Some guys move on, new guys move in. Old guys kind of bring wisdom to the younger, younger people and the, the young guys keep the old guys young. So, but these are gnarly old vines. The amazing thing about this vineyard is um, that it actually survived all of the political turmoil and all the historic events of the past and um, also just the whole growing pattern of the vines is just like weird because it's one of the only vineyards I've been to definitely in South Africa where the, the arms actually coil up and like turns as they're growing up. I've only seen this myself once in Switzerland, in the Valais um, Valley. And um, yes, it's just an incredible, like particular, very individual vineyard. And I think also the fact that all the varieties is mixed up and it's got no real like system to it. It's, it's kind of a vineyard that's just living into its own. And the vineyard's completely solitary. There's no other vineyard within 30, kilometers from this vineyard so it's completely isolated difficult with birds and all of that so we we net the vineyard just before harvest otherwise the birds just basically take the whole crop but the isolation of the vineyard the fact that it sits in this amazing valley north of Paketburg it, it truly makes it one of the most astounding vineyards and just driving up here coming out here there's something about the place and when you taste the wine there's also there's just something in this wine that you don't really find not only in South Africa, but globally. Last year, we actually opted to not take a crop from the vineyard. We only had 140 millimeters of rain out here, and the vineyard looked like really dire and in need. So even before flowering, I, we just made a decision. We cut off all the fruit. And the main reason for that is we didn't want the vineyard to worry about a crop, keep all of its reserves to create proper shoots, create proper material that we could prune from and create a new crop. Yeah, so this year we um, decided to plant uh, lupins and sire oats as a cover crop out here in the footpath vineyard. When we arrived, 
in this vineyard in 2008 um, with the first vintage going into 2009. The soils here in the footpath vineyard were very uh, waterlogged, drenched and like almost suffocated, like there was no um, air in the soil. It's completely compacted and, and, and just logged. So over the last number of years, we've really been focusing on cover crops here. The first number of years, not really with great success, but it's been building, been building, been building. And this year you can see here, there's like there was an amazing cover crop out here in these vines. We've planted these um, lupins. Lupins are, they're very um, basic. They, they basically take nitrogen out of the atmosphere, bind them up, and then in these rhizobiums, introduce them back in the soil. So we use these as uh, nitrogen binders um, for the soil. And the sire harvest will just give us a lot of material to get a proper cover again. And yeah, we'll do a little bit different than the normal rolling of every row every year. This year we'll disc every second row of this in to keep all the nitrogen in the soil. And then every alternative other row we roll flat um, to get like a ground cover. But this vineyard's come a long way. The soil's in a much better state today. And we can see it in the wines. The wines are just more and more balanced. It's not just that, but it's one of the biggest aspects has been just to get some life back into the soil after very many years of just conventional farming throughout the 80s and 90s. The good news and the flip side of it is in 2020, this past season, the wine that we'll release next year, we've made an incredible wine. So this vineyard is a privilege to work with and um, it's a huge responsibility and it's something that, that's been very dear to me and alongside Mrs. Kirsten, I do think this is one of the most unique vineyards, not only in South Africa, but globally. On the topic of history and legacy and just the values of, of the past, I think it's just fitting that we today uh, go through the range of wines that we'll be releasing today in the Old Vine series. The Old Vine series being principally a series of very old vineyards that's bottled. There's eight of them. This year we'll only be releasing seven because we won't be releasing the footbutt, ironically. But I think there's no more fitting place to sit and taste through the wines than here. And I'll just briefly go through the wines and just elaborate a little bit on what you can expect of this year's release. And uh, yeah, it's the only way I can be sharing them with you. And I hope that next year we can get all back together and taste the wines on this weekend. Most people on our mailing list would have received notes on our wines. But for those that didn't, I'm just going to briefly take you through the wines that make, make up the whole Old Vine series. Uh, the Old Vine series is obviously this bottling of very old and historic wines across uh, a number of regions, mostly the Swartland and up in the Willifans Refere region up north up to Klein William and we've got the one vineyard Mrs. Kirsten down in Stellenbosch and um, I'm just going to generalize and then I'll go into a little bit of specifics onto the wines. So in general the vintage was um, it was the third year of the drought so the soil reserves were completely depleted Crop levels was way down, low, low, low. So this is one of the smallest um, bottlings we've done across the whole range. So very limited, the wine that's available. And it's actually a problem with very, very many of these wines actually being, being in quite a demand. But um, all in all, the wines of 2019 as a whole is generalized with even at same alcohol levels of 13 or 13 and a half, whatever it may be. It seemed like the grapes were a lot riper than usual. The wines all have much more tannins. The wines have got greater depth and, and texture to them. And I actually do think that these are wines that will require a little bit of cellaring. And as I've always um, said, and um, I cannot reiterate the fact more, the best thing you can do for these wines is honestly to put them down for the first five years. Um, I actually wouldn't drink them if they're not eight years old, but you know, everyone into their own. So the, the first wine, the Soldat, is a vineyard up, planted up on the Pikeniers Kloof. It's 100% Grenache Noir. 
and um, this year the wines very as usual very bright red colors a um, lot of like pomegranate fresh red fruit next wine the Puffader planted up in the Castileberg on the west side of River Castile in slight soils this is what it's slightly riper than the previous year this is like 13.8 percent alcohol incredibly textured maybe the one that we've bottled in recent years with the most depth to it the 2019 train spur um, 100 percent um, tinta barocca tinta barocca is not that known as a grape but to my mind it's one of the greatest grapes planted in the swartland and um, a wine that we've done a lot of work on not only in the vineyard but also in the winery to try and understand the complexities of the grape uh, it's our most textured tannic and um, long lived of all three of the old vine red wines and um, i do think that this 2019 I, mean, I wouldn't drink it if it's not 10 years old so the scarpe obviously planted there on the west coast north of dwarskerspos on the way to Yelans Bay planted in these um, limestone soils probably our wine with the highest natural acidity and lowest alcohol annually very very saline mineral very grippy wine I think um, you know if you're going to have oysters our oysters in the winter is actually the best season for them it's an incredible wine to pair with oysters we can't obviously visit all of our vineyards but seeing that we're already in the footpath vineyard it's not that far to drive we'll be driving out there just now and um, then i'll share with you what's going up down there up there in the west coast This is the Scarpion vineyard and I do think that um, if Mad Max had a vineyard this would be pretty much it. It's as wild as it gets. This vineyard's based out here on the west coast just south of Irlands Bay and it pretty much gets battered by the southeasterlies that comes off the ocean and that's why you see very many of the arms of the vineyards are actually of the vines are actually deformed and twisted. It's all because of this persistent wind that's just battering this vineyard. The vineyard is a co-planted vineyard, so it's also classified as a field blend. So it's vines of Chenin Blanc and Palomino that's interplanted. The vineyard was planted in the early 30s and um, on top the soil looks like sand, but it's like a sandy top structure of about 30 centimeters and then under that's just pure white chalk. And for the people that know the wine already and the ones that don't, it's probably our wine with the highest level of um, minerality salty characteristics and it's our wine with the lowest alcohol level annually around 12 and a half percent alcohol with a very good acidity it's kind of a wild vineyard but the wine's not all that wild i think the salty acidity liminess and all of that that's pulling in the wine i think that kind of somehow depicts a little bit of the issues and the struggle this vineyard experiences but the climate actually from a temperature point is very moderate down here because of the ocean and the proximity it's about three kilometers from the ocean and um, it's just such a different climate to where all of our other vineyards are located in an area that i just gradually fell in love with okay we're back here in our outdoor tasting room when you look at skirfberg skirfberg is a vineyard that's planted up there in the klein william uh, mountains up close very close to the Skurfkop planted in these deep red table mountain sandstone soils wine very mineral uh, very linear very strict wine actually I, I wouldn't be driving three and a half hours up to Klein William to make Chenin Blanc while we've got very old Chenin Blanc vines planted right, right around where I live it's one of the most incredible dynamics is these Chenin Blancs planted up there in the high altitude. Kuokaboom is a, again, it's a field blend. It's planted to semi blanc and semi gris Planted also up in Klein William. Planted on these table mountain sandstone soils. 
high in iron content, very um, rich, dense wine, probably one of the higher potential wines that we bottle with the most volume and weight to it annually. Um, Semio Blanc and Semio Gris does ripen to that extent up in that slightly warmer climate, but then the altitude keeps the acidity. And then obviously the Mrs. Kirsten Vineyard, the oldest vineyard in South Africa in Chenin Blanc. The vineyard um, I've been working with for the longest time. First vintage was actually 2006. I think this 2019 vintage can rival the 2015, which in my opinion was the best vintage we've bottled previously. And I think it's just fitting that we go out to that vineyard and also see what it's about. It's a wine of stature, it's a little bit like a statesman. It's a wine with just a massive demeanor about it and I think it will be just fitting to visit the vineyard and end off our tour there. This is the Mrs. Kirsten vineyard and it's generally recognized as the oldest Chen and Blanc vineyard in South Africa. And I think having old vines is very good and wonderful and well, but obviously these vines won't live forever. So wherever one of these old vines have moved on, we have incorporated and planted some younger vines. Um, we're not currently including them into the final blend for most, but obviously in time they will become part of the blend. They do ripen at different times at this stage as well, but we have started pruning these much earlier, the young vines much later, and we've been seeing that the window and the gaps been narrowing. So hopefully in time we can include those. I've yet to see a Chenin Blanc that's got this much depth, weight, um, tension, stature, and just gravitas to it and simply one of our most age-worthy wines irrespective of being red or white and we are just very very privileged to be to be making this wine and to have the, the other, yeah the the privilege to work in these vineyards In terms of vinification at the Sali family wines, I think we've come a long way in the last 20 years. One starts out with a, with a concept and I do think, you know, we started in a corner where everybody else was pretty much in the early 2000s where I think at some point we were extracting too much on our wines, we were using too much new wood and um, I think we at times were picking possibly too ripe but over the past 20 years the main line has been, and it's actually running parallel to everything that's going on in the vineyards, is we've been rethinking everything and this is the, we've, only have, we've only got a couple of these left. We've actually, for most, the only wine that's still got barrels in them or the effect of barrels is Kulumela, albeit it being only about 10% new wood. I do think that um, the setting up of the winery today is much more conducive and much more respectful of all the work that's going in in the vineyards. One wants to set up an environment where once the grapes are picked and once they've been pressed and all of that, the aging of the wines needs to be an environment where no other elements gets introduced into the wine. So as opposed to in the early days using maybe too much new oak and all of that, a lot of the development in the winery has been the installation of concrete tanks that are completely neutral. We've bought, from 15 years ago, we've bought these old big wooden casks and wooden vessels. You use them for, for very many years, multiple years. You can use them up to 60, 80 years. But obviously, after two, three years, they lose the marking of, of oak flavors in the wine. And I think <clears throat> when you look at the winery today, and the whole vinification project is, project is very much a standoff where we allow the wines to just be their own. I think one can't, cannot do all that work in the vineyards and then come into the winery and actually do not have a continuation of that work going through into the wines. And the only thing we want to do in the winery is to set up a, a canvas and a network where the wines can be very site specific and they can be very indicative of the sites that they come from and um, when when we'll show some other aspects of the winery you'll see that um, yeah most of the wineries vessels tanks beat concrete eggs the clay amphoras or the clay pots um, the large wood vats some of them 30 years old they're all just there because they actually don't mark the wine in any way it's just 
it's really just the home where the wine can stay for two years or a year prior to bottling. So much have changed in the, in, in the winemaking, the winemaking philosophy. Everybody talks about hands off, but I think, you know, hands off is pretty much to take it as much away as you can. Um, and that's, that can be allowed that the wines can be just the vineyards in liquid form. The two most important wines we produce is our two signature wines, the Kulamella and Palladius. And uh, we've been actually been working on these two wines endlessly over the last 20 years. And the whole I idea and philosophy behind these two wines is to produce two wines, a white and a red, from the Swatland region to carry regional identity into the bottle. In other words, trying to capture the whole of what the Swatland is about. So they have a number of grapes in them and they have a number of different soil types. So whereas the Old Vine series is very much single vineyard bottlings of specific very old sites, these two wines actually have a much bigger dynamic in both of them. The first wine that we produced was actually the Kulamella, with a maiden vintage being in 2000. And uh, this 2018 vintage I think in, in very many terms, the first time I actually tasted it, I wrote a note like it's just like an airplane that's perfectly trimmed out, just flying on altitude, just being in a happy space. And that's 2018 for me. It was the second year of the drought, but we still had carried in some reserves of, two, of the 2016 really good winter that we had, the last good winter. So. The other thing about the signature wines is we always release them a year later than the old vine series. These wines need a lot more time. Um, I'm always hammering on about people drinking our wines too early, but in all fairness, if you drink this wine before it's really eight years old, you're going to be drinking a good wine, but I don't think you're going to get everything that you were actually paying for or waiting for. So this is a blend of Syrah, Mauvert, Grenache, Carian, Sinsa and Tinta Barocca. And then in 2002, two years um, later, we produced the Palladius. So Palladius is a blend of uh, Chenin Blanc, Grenache Blanc, Marsan, Roussan, Viognier, Claret, Palomino, Semio Blanc, Semio Gris, Colombar, Verdello. Um, much bigger blend because our region has just traditionally been planted to more white varieties. And um, this is actually the lowest alcohol Palladius we ever bottled. This one's 13.3% alcohol. And um, it's, more, it's much tighter than actually 2016 and 17. It's a very lean wine, very focused, very trimmed. And um, again, mostly we think that we should age red wines, but this is the kind of white wine that you actually want to age for also eight years and then stuck it into a fridge or an icebox and just have it over a good meal. So the 2018 release on both of these wines, I think just in terms of where the wines are right now, incredibly balanced wines, very harmonious. And normally at this stage in the wines, there's still a, lot, a little bit of uh, like tension and all of that. These two wines are actually already quite rounded out. So you could maybe drink them at five years of age, but Personally, I would have I, I would wait eight years. So, but we're super super stoked about this release. One has to be realistic. What is, what what the future might hold and what may may be coming our way, and um, so we have planted very many new varieties, very many new sites across the Swatland, and all of that work and all of those plannings, hopefully, will give us answers in terms of producing grapes into the future that may be incorporated into this blend and um, yeah, to strengthen the wines and make them more harmonious into the future. You see, this is actually the problem, is 
if you look at this vine, this vine should be completely dormant now, it should be as fast asleep. And it's actually budding now in the middle of winter because we've had just too many warm days. We've had last week a number of days 22 to 25 degrees. We've had one day of 28 degrees last week. And the, the, this vine, this plant kind of senses that, you know, it's time to wake up. But it's actually we sort of mid-July mid and the vine's busy pushing, starting to bud out and everything. Clearly um, the vine's thinking that it's, it's summer already and we're in the middle of winter. And, you know, these are the, the problematic e events that we're currently experiencing. And that's why we need to adapt to a new way of farming, different varieties, different farming techniques, because we, we need to try and circumvent these events. You know, and global warming, is, it's real. It's very, very real. You can see in this vine, I mean, this is a very good shoot, very good shoot thickness, but we start to see more and more thin shoots. So what we, the regenerator farming in the aspect where we need to farm more for soil prevention, for the prevention of soil moisture. Um, our weed control is very important, but it needs to be organic. So we plant a lot of cover crops these days, um, quite high density cover crops plant desirable plants in our in our in our um, in between vine rows and then we've been starting to mulch we've we've been putting quite a lot of mulching around the vines because what what this mulching does is over a season it basically keeps all the soil moisture into the in the ground it gets the air movement and the vapor transpiration of your soil moisture it, it limits that it obviously prevents any weed growth in the immediate vicinity of the plant because you actually shade the soil so you don't have any other weeds that grow around the vines that that can be competitive with this plant and um, it also marginalizes the soil temperature so it just allows <coughs> for your soil to say be on average 10 degrees cooler from minimum to maximum in a day and that makes a huge difference in in terms of your microbiological life in the soil and um, the whole drive is to protect as much as we can of the the natural moisture and the precipitation that we get in winter. Um, and the biggest idea is, you know, with all of this in mind, um, you know, weeds, you don't get really a weed. It's only an undesirable plant or a desirable plant in an undesirable space. So we plant a lot of these um, cover crops. We alternate them. Um, this year we, we've planted a lot of oats, this particular vineyard, but in every vineyard that we farm, we, we plant different cover crops. So. This vineyard is only about 12 years old. This is not a very old vineyard and for a vineyard of this age to really start pushing out a couple of small thinner shoots, it's just indicative of the stress that, that we've been experiencing, especially since 2017. So mulching a lot, working with a lot of cover crops is, is definitely one of the, there's actually no other option out there. Yeah, so what we do is, you know, by looking at these uh, cereals growing here, there's other undesirable plants also growing in here. You know, I can see like this is a little Ramna seeds coming up. But obviously the, as they grow, they're quite, they're very competitive. They also keep the sunlight of the soil. And that's how you just control your whole uh, wheat growth in your rows. And then in early spring, we will come with a big roller and roll it flat and create like we've packed the mulch over there. We will roll this flat and then this will make another carpet in here to keep the soil moisture in here. And for our bush vines, we're still farming bush vine, but we've planted now a, a pole for every vine. And what we will do is, where normally we would have developed the bush vine around here, we're now bringing the bush vine up to about this height. So the vine will come up and we'll do the actual split here. And the main reason for that being um, mainly twofold. One is by raising the bush vine up to this height, when we work with our implements, our plows, our rollers, everything, Everything can get like very close to the vine because the big split is up here and you've actually got a trunk down here so you can get quite close. And then more importantly, by splitting up here, you've got a lot of airflow under the vine, keeping the system healthier. Um, and also by bringing the fruit up to about this height, you obviously have everything away from the immediate soil surface and it's, a, it's all, everything is a little bit cooler up here. And then, 
for the establishment of our vineyards, everywhere we use now these, these are actually engineered by the Israelis. We all know the Israelis are quite prolific when it comes to, um, to farming in very difficult climates with the Negev desert in Israel and all of that. So the first three years we put these down, again, they, um, they eliminate any undesirable plants in the immediate adjacent area to the vine. Secondly, all the moisture gets focused back to the vine, so everything that rains goes back to the, 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 the young plant. And last but not least, you know, it, 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 it locks in the moisture and keeps the temperature also pretty constant around the, the, the root zone. Okay, so reality is um, I love machines, metal, all implements, but with the regenerator farming and changing our composting regimes and everything, we had to change most of our implements. Um, the new compost spreader really been a huge addition. You know, we have to move literally hundreds of cubic meters every year into the vineyards, um, thousands. And um, yeah, we had to change a lot of our implements, a lot of our farming equipment to be able to address the new issues at hand. And um, yeah, we've got now proper operation here set up to, to take care of the vineyards as we need. These old sulfur pots, I mean, we picked them up. They were reconditioned and we, we back to old sulfur dusting now. And I think, you know, it's such a elementary old school way of dealing with um, oedium in your vineyards, but it's really quick. Um, actually, Kali Lowe of Porcelainburg, Kali got me into sulfur dusting again. And you know, if, you, if you've got the right season, you've got enough warm days, um, not too warm because you can't, you can't sulfur dust when you've got above 30s. But if you've got to catch the right weeks in the year, running up to flowering and fruit set, you've got to be finished by fruit set. But it's an amazing way to work your EDM program and it's, it's harmless to the environment. You know, it's, it's the greenest way to go two sulfur dustings in a year and your EDM is basically taken care of. Um, you can do one liquid sulfur, maybe post flowering, and one just after fruit set, but yeah, it's a very, very good way to get through very many hectares very quickly. Now, a lot of the seeding of the cover crops is done with this uh, Vicon spreader. We've just uh, made up this homemade kind of cover and it's basically putting out the seeds at the back and that's how we get uh, evenly distributed cover crop throughout our rows. Very easy, very practical. Look, the, the winery and everything is, you know, the winery, a winery is important, but a winery is one of those um, areas where I think you can only lose things. Whereas when, you, when you're busy with the farming, busy farming the whole year, that's actually where you can make up things and, and really, really farm the best possible fruit. And the last number of years for us has been all about the vineyards. And that's why I actually, basically retrenched myself out of winemaking and um, these days I spend my days on farming and Paul's in the cellar, he's more than capable, he's worked eight years with me and he's taken over the winemaking and I'm free to spend my days with the implements I love, with the vineyards I love and doing the things that makes absolute sense to me. So in terms of the future, people often dwell on the past, they get nervous about the future. I think where we are at this point in time on, in the world, a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, for us as farmers, the biggest uncertainty is global warming, drought, the lack of the precipitation in a year. Those are key elements that make us nervous. And um, I think it's important to have a future policy. And we've taken a a couple of decisions 15 years ago and one of those big decisions was to to wander off to new regions and also into new varietals and um, this is an area up on the west coast it's very close to where actually the old vineyard of Scarpe Unis, just north of Dwarf Kerspos. Right there you see the ocean that's the St. Helena Bay in the background. It's a flat area so it's not from a visual aspect always that spectacular it's um, a place where I actually grew up in this area, but what makes this place amazing is climatically, the ocean, the proximity to the ocean, the cool ocean influence here. And then the other thing is, you've got the sandy top layer of the soil, 
but just under the soil surface here you've got these limestone soils. Now they've got a capacity to capture a lot of moisture in the winter season and also because they often carry a very high pH. Um, they're very, very good in terms of just building up uh, liquid reserves into the future. Um, if you look at some of the greatest locations in the world, be it Burgundy, Champagne, Jerez, all those famous areas, they're all marked by this one soil. And limestone soil within this proximity to the ocean and this cool climate, very rare in the country. So what we've done is we've planted here Assertico, Fermentino, Catarato, um, Bastardo, a little bit of Grenache Blanc, Chenin, Palomino, uh, Grillo, and all of those grapes are actually grapes that's adapted to drought, hydric stress, and a lot of sunlight. So we've got a lot of light here, but we don't have heat here, and we expect to, to procure wines into the future that, from these sites that can bring acidity, freshness, and purity into our wines. And most of these plantings out here is destined very much into the future for the Kulamella and the Palladius wine. I think with the current challenges, I think it's, uh, it's pivotal to plant varieties into the future that's not necessarily being associated not only with the Swatland but, but with South African viticulture. I do think we need to look at planting new varieties that's better adapted to our climate better adapted to the hydric stress that's coming our way in terms of things the rainfall just going getting becoming less and less and less and then thirdly also varieties that's better adapted to the solar radiation patterns that we're currently experiencing so in the last number of years um, a lot of new varieties that we've worked over a very long time have been established in very many new of our plantings and this vineyard for example is a vineyard that we've just established planted here in one vineyard, we planted Fermentino there at the bottom, we planted um, Picapoo Blanc, Marsan, Roussan, uh, Grenache Blanc, the Sensa Blanc planted here, Grillo, Catarato, Fiano, Assertico. A lot of these grapes actually originally from places like Greece, Southern Greece, Sicily, the island uh, in the Mediterranean Ocean, Southern France, southern Italy, areas that's really warm and dry already and where these grapes have already proven themselves to be quite resilient. And these are the new varieties that we'll be planting just to have a card in the deck in terms of not knowing what's coming tomorrow in terms of where our climate is going. Wine is a very long-term thing. I think everything that you do in wine measures up to decades. So I don't anticipate picking any of this fruit into any of our wines in the next decade. Um, but you know, these, it will all depend on the actual um, result from this vineyard. It's a very good site, we've done our homework, but it might be well that these grapes only in 15 years time make their way into the Palladius. So a lot of these new varieties we've actually planted is actually in the future intended to join the Kulamela, Kulamela and Palladius blend. It's also, you know, our appellation is changing, climate is changing and we need to put things in place for the future. Nothing can ever make up for opening a physical bottle of wine and having those in the presence of each other. But uh, yes, it's been um, a way for us through this um, small introduction and film to just share with you a little bit the days that we, that we had and just some of the events over the last couple of months. And I want to thank uh, Stefanus Ravi and Hayden Brown, you know, for persisting over the last two days filming. Yeah, it's just like a people into what we're doing and uh, thanks for tuning in.